After identifying the problem and defining success, you'll need to identify some ways you might achieve that success. There are many potential policy alternatives you could choose from, and this video will briefly walk you through the process. Keep in mind when doing policy analysis for real, this stage of the process will be much larger and more complex. Bardock and Potashnik tell us that you could start by identifying dozens of potential policy solutions and narrowing them down. For this class, you're only identifying two policy solutions as part of your assignment to keep the process moving. Our task here is to come up with a few alternatives or policy solutions to compare. One of these could ultimately become the policy we recommend. There are many policy alternatives out there. Most of them fall into categories, and there are several ways policies have been categorized. Lowy's typology, for example, categorizes policies as distributive, redistributive, or regulatory. A distributive policy provides something to everyone equally, at least in theory. K-12 education, national defense, and police protection are provided to everyone regardless of their ability to pay. These are outputs that it makes sense for everyone to have in the same amount. A redistributive policy provides benefits to one group or population paid for by taxing the resources of another. Redistributive policies might tax corporate profits to pay for SNAP benefits or provide public transit paid for by taxing gasoline bought by drivers. A regulatory policy sets some kind of behavioral standard. Don't throw trash in the rivers, don't assault people, don't smoke in public places. These three types of policy are referred to often and it would be wise to identify which your policy alternatives are. We can get more specific, however. Most of what you identify is going to fall into one of these categories though you'll see that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I've already described what regulation is. Government can also subsidize a good or service it wants to promote by paying for all of or a portion of the cost of that good or service. We want people to be able to afford a place to live. Government might help people in need pay for some of their housing costs. When a good or service is in short supply but high demand and government has control of that resource, it can be rationed. A good example of this is the COVID vaccine. There are 350 million Americans and so far only about 20 million doses of the vaccine. Governments have been strategic about distributing those vaccines. In the fuel shortages of the 1970s, government devised a system where drivers could only purchase gasoline on certain days depending on the digits of their license plate. Taxing and spending is a redistributive policy where government taxes some goods or services to pay for specific policies. For example, when Philadelphia legislation proposed a tax on sugary beverages, the money from that tax was allocated to funding after school activities. Akin to taxing and spending are market incentives. Remember from MPA 506 how government can influence behavior by manipulating the cost of goods. Government can do this specifically by taxing and subsidizing. It would tax to drive up the cost of bad things like cigarettes or sugary soft drinks and subsidize good things like health insurance or electric vehicles. If government itself cannot produce a good or service that it wants citizens to have, it can contract or hire a private firm or nonprofit to provide it. This is often the case when it comes to purchasing products used in the service provision or specialized services. The city of Wilmington has parking enforcement officers, but doesn't own tow trucks. So the city hires a private towing service to tow vehicles when needed. In some cases, government can completely divest from the production and distribution of a good or service and privatize it. In many places, particularly outside of municipal boundaries, there's no government trash collection, so individuals purchase that service from a private company. The government can also educate the public on issues of importance. The best example of this is the public education system. It is in society's best interest to have citizens who can read and write and do math. So government provides for the education of every child from kindergarten to graduation. It can also help reduce smoking by requiring warning labels on cigarette packs that indicate the dangers of smoking. If a problem exists and there isn't enough known about it, government can study or commission the study of it. The National Institutes of Health provide for research into health-related issues. DARPA provides research and development of defense technologies. NASA explores questions related to space and government can hire you to perform policy analysis for them. When you begin considering policy alternatives for your worksheets, keep a few things in mind. Obviously the policy alternatives you're considering should help move closer to the definition of success that you've offered. There should be some logical connection. You'll also want to think about whether your solution is proactive or reactive. While we may always want to think of ourselves as in our perfect solution as proactive, sometimes a crisis arises that we have to react to. This isn't wrong. Proactive policies can keep a problem from arising, but reactive policies mitigate the damage. Policymakers can rightly be accused of putting a band-aid on a problem, reacting to things that could have been prevented. 
In some cases, however, all we can do is react. We may be obliged to react now to stave off the damage while we come up with a proactive policy to prevent that problem in the future. When looking for policy alternatives, the best thing you can do is look for examples. Who has been particularly good at solving one problem or another? What did they do? And can we do that? Salt Lake City is held up as an example of housing first solutions to homelessness by building villages of tiny houses. California is ahead of most other states on policies to reduce climate change. Advocates for universal health care often look to Canada or Britain as models of policy, and the Affordable Care Act was based on, on Massachusetts' approach to health care. You may also peruse professional or public policy literature like the National Governors Association or the National League of Cities for best practices. As you consider your policies, really think about how they work and try to describe that. What does the policy actually do and how does that help? What are the mechanisms by which the policy helps achieve success? You don't always have to start from scratch. You may find that a current policy could be tweaked or modified to achieve success. Have a look at the current policies you identified in your problem definition. Maybe with some changes, that policy can help achieve the desired outcome. Finally, and importantly, you'll always want to include the null in your analysis. The null means no change. It means we will continue to do things exactly as we are now. When you project the future outcomes of your policy analysis, this allows you to also project the outcomes of continuing with the status quo. Sometimes you might find that this is the best outcome. I want to leave you with a simple example of what this might look like. If I'm considering the problem of rental housing deterioration due to landlord disinvestment and set a desired outcome or goal of ensuring landlords properly maintain the housing units they rent, I would identify two potential solutions. Alternative one is a regulation. We require an inspection of the property in question at the time of application and renewal of rental permits. A permit is not issued until the property is found to be compliant with housing code. The second alternative is a subsidy where government reimburses up to $1,000 in maintenance per rental unit per year. Both can move us closer to the desired outcome, but use different methods to get us there. I would compare these both with the null or what is being done now, where rental property inspections don't occur until someone calls in a complaint, which rarely happens because tenants fear retribution from their landlords. When you turn in worksheet one, I'll give you some feedback and may ask you to revisit some of your ideas or elaborate on some of your responses. As you continue through this course, you'll get a sense of how to think through some of these ideas and questions.